Greetings world historians and today we're looking at a camel because we're going to be talking about the Silk Roads which goes back to uh, Robert Strayer's theme of the three C's which if I remember correctly uh, we have change, uh, we have connection and we have comparison all of three of which of course um, can be seen through uh, today's topic but this is just going to be uh, a brief introduction and uh, we should also note that when Strayer uh, comes to talk about this um, uh, theme of the Silk Road in his textbook, he throws in another two seeds, which are uh, commerce and culture. So, summing up, the uh, Silk Road is essentially the um, network of long-distance uh, trade routes that connected uh, East Asia all the way through the Middle East uh, via Central Asia, uh, and was a major force in, in globalization. Uh, in change uh, and connection, and we can use it to uh, compare different cultures. Um, but it's also important to recognize this is also a route of cultural connection. So we're not just talking here about uh, beans and hard cash, we're talking about uh, religion, uh, philosophy, uh, empire. So let's go on to origins of the Silk Road. First of all, where does the name Silk Road originate? Origins of the term. Um, well, first of all, uh, we should point out that uh, no one uh, in the first uh, 3,000 years of uh, the history of the Silk Road ever used the term Silk Road. In fact, it's, it's a, a perfectly misleading term uh, in that it suggests something like uh, the I-75 highway, whereas, in fact, um, certainly the term Silk Routes uh, would be a, a, a more accurate description of the fact that this is a, a network of uh, communication, of uh, traffic, of infrastructure, um, but also that this is uh, a, a development um, of uh, globalization. This is not specifically referring to something that we could see uh, from a satellite in space and identify this as, oh, there is a, you know, Silk Road running down the middle of uh, Eurasia. Um, but the origin of the term was actually coined, interestingly enough, by a uh, German archaeologist in the 19th century, a guy called uh, uh, Friedrich uh, von Richthofen, um, who you may not have heard of, uh, but those of you who are uh, fans of the, uh, the First World War, perhaps military history buffs, uh, may have heard of his nephew, uh, who went on to become the famous First World War fighter uh, pilot, uh, uh, the, the Red Baron, as he was known. Uh, but anyway, um, these trade routes, these uh, tr going all the way through um, Asia, linking Asia uh, from uh, China, the capital of China at the time was uh, Qian, uh, all the way through uh, the Middle East, through regions of the world which today we would consider to be uh, perhaps sort of post-Soviet, uh, without wanting to sound derisory, uh, backwaters, places like Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, which were major centers of urban civilization and ultimately linking uh, East Asia, the powerhouse of China, to the modern day Middle East, uh, to Syria, uh, to Lebanon, and then on via the Mediterranean to, to Europe. Um, and this originates really uh, with the, the early origins of uh, Persian civilization around the fourth uh, millennium BC. So we're talking about a, a very, very early uh, development here. Um, and this goes back as well to, I think, the, the theme of um, uh, the, the sort of importance of environment, uh, the fact that this was a, uh, you know, east-west uh, corridor, um, but something that was uh, really made possible by the domestication of uh, domestic animals like uh, the, the camel that we looked at uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the class today, uh, but also horses, uh, donkeys. Um, and the beginning of uh, the foundation of, of modern China really helps to accelerate this process, which was already by that stage, uh, you know, several, several hundreds, uh, if not thousands of years old, going back to uh, the foundations of what was referred to by the Persians uh, as the King's Highway. This is, again, the, the correlation between empire uh, and infrastructure. So we have uh, 
Uh, in the 3rd century BCE, we have the arrival of the uh, short-lived but very uh, influential Qin dynasty, which is where we get the name uh, China. Uh, and an emissary from the, the dynasty uh, with a wonderful name, uh, Chang Zhan, was sent west uh, in uh, the, the period following the Qin dynasty um, to establish uh, military relations with a uh, nomadic people called the, the Yuezi. Uh, and we, we talk about the UAZ. Uh, who, are, who are they? Uh, well, in this picture here, we can see some of their uh, modern day descendants um, living in uh, the very far west of uh, the state of modern China. Um, the, these are people called uh, the Uyghurs. Uh, these are people of uh, Turkic origin. And uh, notably, this is the one province in China, uh, and this again is a clue to the influence of the Silk Road where the majority of the population are actually uh, Muslim. Now, their ancestors included uh, these nomadic groups, uh, the USA. Uh, and this is long before the, the, the advent of Islam. Uh, but the reason that the Chinese uh, were trying to establish uh, connections, um, again, China was a very urban, uh, a very sedentary uh, civilization under the Qin dynasty. Uh, famously, they had built uh, the wall, which is often seen, uh, perhaps somewhat misleadingly, as, as a kind of uh, uh, defensive seal around the, the western boundaries. Um, but they're also interested in, in trade, uh, engaging uh, with foreign cultures, uh, and also uh, adopting, uh, you know, uh, technologies. And in the case of uh, the USZ, uh what the Chinese were really interested in uh, was, of course, uh, the horse. Now it may seem strange to talk about uh, the horse as being uh, the stimulus for the development of uh, the Silk Road under Chinese imperial um, sponsorship, but we have to remember that the horse um, in the ancient world is really a kind of uh, you know cross between uh, an M1 Abrams tank. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, you know the the uh, luxury car of its of its day. It was both a prestige uh, status symbol, um, but it was also a military necessity. Increasingly, in this world where uh, China, urban China, was being uh, pillaged uh, and made to pay tribute by um, various other nomadic groups. Um, it made sense for the Chinese uh, under the Qin and the later the, the Han dynasties to establish relationships with um, nomadic groups uh, in a way to uh, co-opt uh, and to develop uh, their own military. So in some way, these, these UAZ were uh, mercenaries, much in the same way as the Roman Empire would eventually uh, include uh, many of the same uh, tribes which we often associate as uh, the barbaric tribes of, of uh, you know, the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths. And the USZ, though, had a, uh, a kind of blood feud, if you like, or a, uh, a long historic uh, rivalry um, with another group who we may, may be much more uh, familiar with. Um, and these are uh, the people who are known in the West as uh, the Huns. Um, so China, uh, their, their main threat to their national security or, or to the security of the empire was um, the Huns. The UAZ were uh, warriors like the Huns, uh, nomadic people, uh, horse breeders like the Huns. And this was, again, uh, a technology and an agriculture that the Chinese had not developed themselves. Um, China itself was very heavily populated, very densely populated. And much of the land was intensively farmed by uh, rice and, and other crops. So from this point of view, uh, it made sense to develop uh, long distance connections uh, with the, the USA. And these, uh, these connections later develop into uh, not only territorial expansion, but also commercial expansion, cultural expansion, and the expansion of what we come to know as the Silk Road.